In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophets. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage." When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, They offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you, sisters and brothers, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The strange starlight brought the wise men from miles away, but they're still really mysterious figures in and of themselves. We have come to call them wise men, or magi, or kings, but it's unclear exactly who they are, or who, if anyone, they represent. Most likely, they were something like astrologers from the area of modern-day Iraq or Saudi Arabia, but even that's not certain. We have also long numbered these wise men as three, just like that beloved Christmas carol says, but that's only because the three gifts are mentioned in the story. So the number of wise men or magi could have been an entire entourage of star uh, trackers um, or a big Middle Eastern caravan as far as we know. Regardless of who the magi really are, their mysteriousness is part of the point. The mystique that surrounds their identity even to this day and age, is exactly why Matthew wanted to make sure that we, in our day and age, knew the story. The point is that a group of foreigners see an extraordinary star shining in the sky, and they're drawn to the place where the star shuts off. After a brief detour, to King Herod, during which all of Jerusalem 
gets worked up into a tizzy. The wise men find the child Jesus, and they pay him homage. They honor him with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Perhaps, as Martin Luther once suggested, (coughs) the wise men find the child Jesus. Perhaps they first went to Jerusalem because it was the capital city, and where else would a king be born but near a royal palace? In this case, the royal city actually appears to be Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, which they discover after Herod's own team of scholars find this relatively obscure passage from the prophet Micah. Once they start for Bethlehem, the star automatically clicks on and off again, and the wise men are filled with great joy. Why did the star not take the wise men straight to Bethlehem without consulting scriptures, Martin Luther once asked, because God wanted to teach us that we should follow the scriptures and not our own murky ideas. And I think that's a verbatim quote from Martin Luther. Be that as it may, Matthew makes it clear from the very beginning of his gospel message that all people, all people will be drawn to this light. What has drawn you to Jesus? And I'll ask that again. What has drawn you to Jesus? What leads you to seek Jesus' company and the company of other believers? Each of us has our own journey across life's desert, as the wise men did, to come face to face with our Lord. What has been the star for you? What is that light in the darkness that helps you make your way? Now, it might be Holy Scripture, and that's the case for many of us. It may be the words or presence of a particular person who shared God's love with you. And I would say that many gathered here yesterday for Joe Malley's funeral. Um, For them, Joe had been a light that led them to Jesus. Or it may be the life of forgiveness and selfless care as it's embodied by the community of believers. Now, one can say that a church needs to be many things. It needs, for example, to be a center of worship and community service. And I think that's, most importantly, what we do here at Emmanuel. It needs to be a place where children and adults can learn more about Scripture and their faith tradition and how to forgive and love other people. And I think that happens here as well through our Sunday school and our vacation Bible school and other programs. It needs to be a voice for justice and compassion in the world at large. But above all, the church needs to be a place where all people are continually drawn in communion with Jesus Christ so that we too, may pay homage to him. Our congregation, of course, is named Emmanuel, which I think is a beautiful name, and it puts Jesus Christ front and center to the people that we serve. No congregation ever really exists, though, only for the sake of the people who have already become part of it, for the sake of people maybe whose ancestors were on the charter rolls of the church and have been here for many generations. Any congregation's existence, no matter how strong or weak their programs may be, 
any church's existence is based on meeting the needs of those who have not yet come to us or come to faith or who are lingering around the fringes of it and the Holy Spirit is drawing them to us. The church seeks, exists to draw in those who are seeking to be a first taste of the communion of saints for those who realize that they are sinners. And I count myself among that group. Imagine the kind of God who gathers all of his people together, not simply for their own sake, but for the sake of the world that God's Son may be known. That's the God who's the Magi were seeking. Now, as most of us are aware, there is, there is some anxiety within individual congregations and in larger denominations as a whole about declines in membership and activity and maybe even also influence. And much of this has happened during and after the COVID pandemic. To be quite honest though, I think any congregation can fall into this trap at just about any time. And to complicate matters, it's not always so clear cut which ministries and programs are all about self-preservation and which ones really grow out of pure intentions to, spe uh, to spread the word about Jesus Christ. And that's one of the, the challenges that our new council elected in a few weeks from now will face. How are we, that's one of the questions that we will face, how are we serving those who have not yet become a part of us? How are we drawing people to the light of Christ, which is really the purpose for why the church exists. One former Episcopal pastor by the name of Barbara Brown Taylor, um, a very uh, well-respected scholar, Barbara Brown Taylor has wisely observed that at least one reason for the urgency about drawing people to churches even when it ends up being about self-preservation, is because people know that the church is the place of divine transformation. It's the place where people say yes to both God and to one another. As an example of saying yes, we have a group that will be delivering a meal to the the folks that are in residence at PADS in Ottawa uh, in the next week. I believe that's a week from today, as a matter of fact. We are in that process saying yes to God, <clears throat> but also yes to our neighbors. <clears throat> the church is where strangers from afar or from nearby are made brothers and sisters of the one true king. After all, the wise men did go home by another way. They were transformed by what they encountered in the first Epiphany way station. Remembering our Epiphany and enabling these holy encounters of people with their Savior is a mighty task for any congregation. And we can sense urgency in everything we do, but when we let it be Jesus who shines, and not just our programs and our services to the community that shine. We're not just highlighting the latest gizmo or church growth program or some murky ideas of our own, as Martin Luther might put it. When we are highlighting Jesus, the Savior, our lights will not go out. <coughs> when each of us helps each of us remember that it is chiefly Jesus who is being offered here in word and sacrament, 
for the sake of our community, for the sake of the world, then we will never really have to worry about our survival. And we will never have to be ashamed of what Jesus calls us to do. When we take to heart that every little interaction that each of us has, every little word we say to each other or to people outside of this space, when we realize that that can be a holy reflection of the gift that each of us has, <coughs> or it can be like Herod's scheming and turning people away, then we are taking seriously our task as a church. And, we th and when we think that the little light of grace and glory goes blinking and fluttering on and off inexplicably from time to time, it's not because Christ has left the building or because we need to shout out, hey, your light has gone out again. More often than not, things have gone dark because we have taken our eyes off the brightest and best, best of the stars of the morning. For Jesus is the star who never takes his eyes off us, no matter what we do or how far we may wander. He has been sent to stay, save and restore, to make the world whole again. He is the king of all kings, the one who dies that all may live and receive the treasure, the treasures of mercy and forgiveness and grace and life evermore. In Jesus' name, amen.